everyone. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. Marisha Pessel is the New York Times bestselling author who captured audiences with her books, Special Topics in Calamity Physics and Night Film. Her latest novel, Never World Awake, is an absorbing psychological suspense thriller in which fears are physical and memories come alive. Please help me welcome Marisha Pessel. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes. So I was telling you in, in the back, you have a new fan with me. I, you know, I've been wanting to read more. It's always so hard to find the time and to, but I read through this in about three sittings. It was really, really quick. So kudos to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So that was very much my intention for this book. I wanted people, I wanted hands, literal or figurative hands to come out and just make sure people stayed seated reading in their seat. Yeah. And especially in this time when everybody's binge watching shows, like I some evenings went home and I didn't turn on the TV. I was reading, which felt really, really good. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, that's the, actually the best review I've ever gotten. Awesome. That you didn't watch Netflix and you read my book. Like I can <laughs> retire now. <laughs> that's amazing. So it's so hard for me to even talk about this book without be like asking and giving spoilers. But so I'm gonna let you describe what Never World Awake is about. Yes, I mean, I very much hope that you go into reading this book knowing as little as possible. So um, I'll say that it's a psychological claustrophobic thriller about five former high school friends who, after finishing their freshman year of college, come back for a reunion of sorts. And um, it takes place over a weekend. So... Um, I think that they all believe that they're just going to have a good time, but they have a near-death experience in a car, and they think that they have survived, and they return to this estate. Um, they've been drinking. Things are getting a little rowdy when a mysterious man knocks on the door and announces that they're in a Neverworld wake, which is basically a version of purgatory. Um, you have to read the book to find out exactly where they are, but um, it's a murder mystery, and they basically have to solve the death of the sixth friend who died their senior year of high school. Are you guys hooked yet? Do you want to know how that ends? <laughs> so what was the starting point for this book? Because for me, it started off just so like casual and normal and then like very quickly turns into this whole other world. So where did you even start in creating this story? Yes, well, I was definitely influenced by one of my favorite authors, Agatha Christie. And of course, she has that very well-known trope of um, five or six disparate characters descending on a remote estate and the lights go out and the storm is coming and the bodies start piling up. So I love that idea of being stuck somewhere. Um, you know, five or six very different people who are forced to remain in one place. So I, I definitely wanted to write a smaller novel. My first two novels are all over 500 pages. So I, I had this little idea um, to do something in a shorter book and see if I could stick to that tighter canvas. But it was really um, a detective story because I thought if characters are trapped in time, you can technically become the best detective on earth because you can you have all the time in the world to try different techniques for interviewing witnesses or you can trawl through um, any number of texts to find this level of expertise. So having all the time in the world really turns you into Sherlock Holmes on steroids. So I wanted to use that in this particular book as they solve this mystery. Yeah, and there's a lot of different themes throughout the book, one of them being this idea that time isn't necessarily linear. And so why was that something you wanted to kind of explore more? Yes, I mean, I actually went down a few rabbit holes in the research of this book about time and how actually when you go to these like really remote blogs of Cambridge physicists, they're all talking about time travel. And in the outer reaches of Einstein and relativity, a lot of it is time travel. And that one of the major hindrances of time travel is that the body does not hold up um, at speeds approaching the speed of light. So if you really solve that... Um, you can basically time travel. So I started thinking about time. And I also love how sometimes time for us, just living our daily lives, speeds up mm -hmm. and time is very slow. And um, I love how that kind of interplays based on what you're doing with your life. And it works really well in this book. Oh, thank you. It's, a, like you said, a very important part in them solving certain mysteries right. is that time element, oh. which I thought was really creative. Thank you. Good for you. Um, another theme that's throughout it is the idea of suicide. That's something I sort of saw throughout. So why was that something you wanted to incorporate? Um, well, you're right. Not giving too much away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, 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 of course. Uh, I would say that um, 
the intersection between life and death is very interesting. And um, I'm married to a doctor, and um, sometimes he'll come home from work and talk about people who, waking up from surgery, have had these you know, these really strange experiences that are inexplicable. Um, so at that very mysterious spot between life and death, all sorts of amazing things happen um, and things that are very personal and you can never, um, you can relate your experience, but can you prove that it happened? No. So that's very much an idea that I applied to Neverworld. Yeah. And the characters, you answered that really well, by the way. Oh, oh yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, the characters are so well developed in in my opinion just we get these good backstories and so i want to know for you what is your process in one forming these characters and why is it so important to really fill them out yes i mean i approach every book um from the standpoint of a reader, what would I like to read? Um, so I tend to like characters that are eccentric and paradoxical and strange and, um, you know, that leave me guessing, um, that's blurt things that don't really make sense at times. So I like to have that three dimensionality. Um, and the way I do that um, in terms of my particular process is. Uh, I spent a lot of time before the actual writing creating a Bible for myself, which is basically created through just a pen and paper. And I start writing histories of who each of these characters are, what their secrets are, their backgrounds, who their parents are, what are they afraid of, what do they want more than anything, what would they kill for, because that's always very important to know. Uh, so I spent a lot of time prior to the writing just saturating myself with who these characters are, and sometimes writing in their particular voices, and then also pulling a lot of visuals, usually from the internet, but other books. Um, not necessarily pictures of celebrities like, you know, Jennifer Lawrence's Beatrice or anything like that. It's more just like texture, like um, what would this particular character gravitate towards if um, he or she were walking through an antique shop or something and you know someone pulled down this like little um, antique photograph so things that um, that each of these characters would gravitate towards and then at the end of all of that research you sort of have a sense of the texture of these people and then it really character grows from each draft and for each of my books I it seems I do about three drafts. There's the first draft, the second draft, and the third draft. The second draft and the third draft, my editor is there helping me um, and offering a lot of feedback. So I think that's when the final elements of character really take place in that final editorial process. And do you ever put yourself in any of these characters? I do it in the sense of um, an actor playing a role. They're all m versions of me. I mean, I think... I like to find the humanity in each character, and um, you, in order, even the evil characters that I've written in the past, you have to have a sense of, um, you know, they might be doing really maniacal things, but where are they coming from as human beings? How did they become that way? And um, and so that's kind of the line that I like to walk. And. Um when you start a book like this, do you already know how it's going to end and do you write to that point or is it you're sort of discovering along the way? Yes, um, the one thing that I always know is the ending because I like to know the final twist. I usually have twists at the ends of my books and I like to surprise the reader and have everything that came before sort of cascade into place. So I usually always know the ending and a few plot points along the way I like to know the secrets that people are hiding, but sometimes those can change if I, if I imagine something that's stronger in terms of a, a choice for the characters. But yes, I, I usually always know the ending. And I could tell, because there's very much, uh, once I got to the end, I was like, I kind of want to go back and reread it because it felt like, oh, I'm, I maybe missed oh, that connection. Oh, that makes sense. You know, you can, it's sort of like watching Game of Thrones, you know, <laughs> when you go back and you kind of catch things a second time around. Yeah, totally, yeah. 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 Oh, th I'm glad you want to reread it. Yeah. It's very nice, thank you. So what is your writing process like? Because I know a lot of people like to call themselves writers, um, but to actually, you know, be doing your third book and uh, that takes 
amazing discipline. So do you, are you somebody who makes sure to write every day? Do you write a certain number of pages? What is that like for you? Yes. I, I mean, I think a lot of the perception is novel writing is sort of like waiting for muses. I mean, some people think that, but um, for me, it's approaching it with a Navy SEAL discipline. Like this is something that I want to do. There's a craft to it. It's a craft and an art and a trade in some ways too. So, um, and that requires just doing it every day. And it's very much akin to being a, an athlete. And if you want to be a long distance runner, you have to train and run f longer and, you know, your entire uh, training and th that level of discipline goes into becoming a long distance writer. And I mean, a runner, <laughs> a long distance runner, that writer too. Uh, so I think that um, discipline for me is paramount. And it's, it's not really discipline because when you love something so much, and I love books, I think that they're like magnificent things. And um, so to be working to create one, as difficult as it can be sometimes, is still something really cool to do, so. Is that your top tip for writers or is there another tip that you're like, you should always Discipline. do this or never do this? Reading and writing constantly, yeah. like reading everything. I, I still read everything I can get my hands on, though it's hard because I have kids now. But um, but yes, like reading the high, the low, the commercial, um, reading the books that you in the same genre that you're writing, mm -hmm. whether it's a literary thriller or you know Pulitzer Prize. I mean, just the whole range. I like to read everything. I like to read what's popular. I like to read what's not popular. And this is your first book that's in the young adult category. Yes, yes. So how did that change your writing style? Was that more difficult? What are some of the things you kind of had to adjust doing this book? Yes, well, it really started out as a side project because I was working on my next adult novel and um, when this little idea came into my head. And I always knew that I wanted to write in the young adult space. I just didn't exactly know the how or the why. And um, I very much approached it as a debut novelist. I mean, it, young adult really is its own world. Um, the passionate readers of young adult sometimes don't even read adult, like they're so gung-ho with young adults. So um, I had the benefit of um, being able to work with this incredible editor who has a lot of experience in young adult. And um, I let her sort of chaperone me through this process. And the wonderful thing about it was, is that I didn't have to change anything. I didn't have to censor myself in any way. There was no subject matter or plot point that I couldn't write into the book. Um, and that was so refreshing to know that with young adults, adult fiction, you can really write about anything. It's really just how you're going to write it. And um, so that was the only thing that I changed was economy. But that was really a, um, something that I put on myself. I wanted to know if I could write a book that was shorter than 500 pages and still not sacrifice anything in terms of quality. So um, that was really just a parameter that I put on myself. I also think, too, in this category, at least, um, there was something really pure about it. Even well, like the, with the protagonist, with the main, you know, just that, I think her being like a young adult protagonist really worked. Oh, thank that, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I wanted to, the idea, I guess, could happen with characters who are older, but I, I high school is such a um, highly charged, you know, time for everybody. Um, so I wanted characters who were just outside of that really kinetic, wild time. And then to have to re come back, you know, once they you think you're gone, they pull you back in. So you're they have to relive all those things that they thought they escaped in high school, which is kind of a nightmare. Yes, it's <laughs> definitely a nightmare for a lot of people. Yeah, right. And so you've had two other books that have been just wildly successful. Um, you know, I, it would be hard to imagine that there wasn't like a little bit of just like, OK, how do I approach a third book in a way that is still interesting? Do you find yourself ever competing with your previous projects or feeling intimidated by them? You know, how do you sort of overcome that to push forward? Um, well, I actually returned to this um, a few years ago. I was at some sort of, I think it was some sort of cocktail party, and someone was talking to me about, again, I'm bringing up Navy SEALs. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, part of the Navy SEAL, someone had experience with Navy SEALs, and they were saying that um, one of the things that is very critical to them is the beginner's mind. And that very much resonated for me, that every novel, I have to have a beginner's mindset. I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. Um, I do have that experience behind me of having other books published, mm -hmm. but um, approaching something with a sense that this is going to be a new situation and 
you're going to have to react to the problems that are in the immediate present. That's sort of how I just really focus on what I'm doing and whatever happened in the past is the past. Yeah. And I couldn't help, you know, as I was reading to feel like this would be a great movie, especially there's a scene around a pond and I just was visualizing it so vividly, like I yeah. could see it on a screen. Yes. So talk to me about that. Do you have that in mind when you're writing? Are any of your books currently you know, in, you know, going to become a movie, movie, what's that process like? Yes. So I don't have that in mind. I mean, for me, the book is the medium. That's my specialty. I'm not thinking about the film adaptation. Um, the beauty of a book is that you can have 3,000 extras that you don't have to pay scale. You can have um, so many different characters. You can have, you know, you can travel the globe without worrying about, like, you know, how much the budget is. So um, the beauty of a book is that it can jump forward, it can jump into minds. So for me, the medium is key, is king. Um, but all three of my books, including Never World Wake, have been optioned, and um, I can't say much about Never World Wake, but it's very exciting, and um, never, um, night film and special topics are also being adapted. And then in general, do you think the ability to make a book into a movie is something that helps it become successful nowadays? I mean, of course, you have a larger audience. Um, but, I mean, I love these books that stand on their own. We go back to Holden Caulfield, and, um, you know, that's never going to be adapted into a movie. Um, Salinger actually was very specific. He never wanted um, a face on the cover. Um, so the books that resonate, I mean, in this world, I mean, it really is, I mean, there's, then there's Game of Thrones. So it's just kind of everything, but books that also just remain books are so beautiful and they have a huge cultural impact. And, um, the beauty of it is, is that books are not going away. Cause I remember when I first published my novel, um, my first novel, there was this talk that, you know, oh, books are on their way out. And I remember someone at a reading was like, you're going to be out of a job, you know, you better enjoy this because no one's going to care. And the, the thing is, that's not, it's turned out not to be true. Do you read ebooks? I do not, no. So we were talking about this. I don't either. <laughs> oh, and I, don't? Yeah, oh, and I was gosh. talking about how fun it is to actually go into a Barnes and Noble now and how novel like, an idea that is, but right. there is something still to that. Yes, and now with bookstagrams, I mean, it's so incredible, like the physical object of a book is just so um, not, a, yeah, I mean, it's being used in social media in a really way, in a way that I don't think anyone anticipated. Yeah. Um, but for me, I love a physical book, and I like the rest and the uh, just the quietude that one gets with a physical book that I just find with e-books, it's not the same experience. I agree. I like to yeah. fold the pages. I like to lend them to people. Yes, I think and it's, underline things and yeah, yes, it's a whole experience. The, yes, fold the ear, you know, dog ear. Yeah. The yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good time to open up to the audience for some questions. Where's our first one? Oh, right there. Hi. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, when you create the Bible and how you develop characters right. um, and you delve kind of deep into into the visuals for them. In your books, um, and particularly I think of like night film, you um, location plays a very, very important role. And I was wondering how you research locations and, um, you know, do you travel? What, how, what role do, the, do those play? Yes, I mean, I believe that a novelist needs to leave one's office and go out into the world. So absolutely for location, there's no substitute to actually walking those hallways and those cobblestone streets. So I did, for night film, I did a lot of wandering the city by myself, um, you know, going into, I mean, scaring myself, but never doing anything too dangerous. But yes, having a sense of the city at night and Chinatown and um, just all of those different neighborhoods because there's no substitution for it. And um, now with my new book, I have like a list of places that I actually need to go visit, which is a wonderful thing because um, you can write it, but you're going to have to go back and actually be there. There's no substitution. And yes, Google Maps is wonderful because you can drop that little orange man down and you can look around and see the subway and the laundromat, but you have to physically be there because there's, uh, there's always something that you will find out is entirely different than what you thought. I think locations also have like an energy, you yes, know, yes. that you kind of have to pick up on oh, to be there. Totally, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Next question. Hi there. Hi. Your question, your characters are so interesting. So I'm going to follow up a question that you asked already. 
Um, is there any relation between the characters in Neverworld Wake and the characters in Special Topics and Calamity Physics? They're a year younger. Yeah. And is there any relation between the characters and beside yourself, other real people? Um, well, it's very, so no, no overt relation. I mean, they're both similar, as you say, in age, and they both, um, the cliques of the Blue Bloods and Special Topics, and then this circle of very close-knit friends in Neverworld have the, I mean, some of the same dynamics of having had this mini family within the high school experience. Um, but in terms of drawing from my real life, the only time I did that was um, with the character of Zach in Special Topics. I literally wrote him from my high school into the book, not really realizing that it was going to be published and that he would read it one day and he would realize, like, you know, all of the things that Blue experienced with Zach. Actually, I experienced to some extent. Um, not exactly, but some of those things. So um, after that, I've really gone out of my way to have all of my characters be a composite. And uh, writing for me is not writing for my real life. It's very much this imaginative feat. And um, it's almost like a magician's feat. You're not sure you can pull it off. And it, it's an illusion that you have to really make people believe in. I would love to live inside your imagination for like an hour. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I could handle it. Actually, it's a pretty good. I, I enjoy it. That's all that counts. It works. It's working for you. Okay, it's working for me. And we have one last question. Hi. Hi. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, your novels being adapted to films. Yeah. I was wondering if you would ever write a film yourself. Yes, I would. But right now, my answer is I'm really... Um, focused on novels. I'm not going to say I won't at some point, but um, I think writing a good novel requires so much blood and guts and, um, yeah, is, you know, basically, you know, yeah, it's, it's a very intense process. So um, I think that that really takes every fiber of one's being. So that's what I'm focused on at the moment. Following up on that, do you write multiple projects at the same time, or is it really just one and then moving on to the next? I do. I actually, especially now that with Neverworld, it really started as a side project. So um, I do. I think um, after having children, I realize time, Tempest Fugit, and now there's a haste and a need to get these stories into the world. Um, so now I'm wondering why before I had kids, I haven't published like 15 novels because I had so much time on my hands. But um, now, yeah, now I... And the wonderful thing about working on multiple projects is, is when you reach a sort of stopping point on one, you can just switch to the other, and that can loosen something on the other novel. So right now I'm enjoying that. Well, I enjoyed your book very oh, much. And I think you, you guys so will much. too. It's available now on Amazon and wherever you buy books. If you like real books, go to Barnes and Noble and check out Neverworld Awake, available now, and give it up for Marisha Pessel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much.